Hi, my name is Kevin Thomas, W1DED. Today's guest, Philip Springer, Delta Kilo 6 Sugar Papa, has emerged as an important youth leader in ham radio. He's an avid contester, de-expeditioner, and even finds time to do some QSL manager work, which I find kind of amazing. He has recently earned his bachelor's in business administration and is studying for his master's in logistics and distribution. That's outside of ham radio. Back in ham radio, he recently came back from Corsica, where he and a group of people operated a multi-two effort um, under the call sign TK4W. Really interested in hearing more about that. Philip, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Nice to be on the show. So I understand you were licensed at 10 years old. So I'm guessing you're probably in your mid-20s now. Um, so you've been a ham for a while. Tell me about getting started at 10. Yeah, um, it is quite a long time ago, definitely. Uh, I'm now 26 years old, just turned 26 in October this year. Um, I started back in 2008 um, when my best friend's mom basically just uh, invited me to join a electric uh, electronic soldering uh, session at the local radio club. And this is how I got infected with the whole stuff, basically. <laughs> um, they turned on the radio um, after the soldering uh, was done. And there was the infection born of amateur radio within my career, let's say. Uh, then in 2011, um, we did the first uh, novice license. Back then I was uh, Delta Oscar 6 Papa Sierra. Um, but yeah, with the time evolving in 2013, um, I set the, uh, the the full class license exam and became Delta Kilo 6 Sierra Papa. So this is a short summary of uh, how I got to where I am now. So that's how you got your license. Where were you operating back then? Did you have a home station? Uh, I had, or I still have, a home station, uh, which is just a few meters of wire and 100 watts. Uh, though my uh, local radio club still has uh, quite a good station. Uh, though I'm visiting quite a few friends here in the Bavarian uh, countryside um, where I'm living uh, also now. Um, who have bigger stations for contesting purposes um, and DXing, of course. And when was your first contest? When did you first get the bug? <laughs> Back in 2008, <laughs> when, when I was definitely operating as uh, Delta November 5 Kilo India Delta, uh, which is an educational call center in Germany. Um, of course, it was not competitive, but uh, the first contest bug was set in 2008. That was interesting. You may have uh, watched my interview with Dan Craig and 6MJ, and he also yeah. started contesting very early. He was licensed early, but uh, contesting was uh, a passion early on, so that's uh, an interesting parallel. Philip, I know that you're involved with a lot of ham radio organizations, a long list, and I'm not even going to dare try to get it right. So would you go through that for us, your various board affiliations and organizational affiliations? Yeah, it's uh, it, it was getting a little less um, over this year um, due to some reasons, but uh, currently I'm involved with the uh, Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation as a director on the board uh, based in the US. Um, and most recently, <laughs> I became the president of the German DX Foundation. Um, so these are currently my two board positions uh, I do. Um, I'm also within the uh, Youngsters on the Air Contest Committee, uh, Yota Contest Committee. Uh, some of the guys in the U.S. hopefully know that, uh, about the contest. Um, it's a little bit more popular in, in Europe, uh, though we have, uh, we have to have it evolving all over the world. So the people do, um, yeah, support the youth, or let's say the, the amateur radio guys of tomorrow. So, Philip, I, I get the being licensed at 10 years old and getting interested in contesting. I can relate to that. I was also in, licensed as a, uh, uh, a teenager, and contesting was something that appealed to me right away. What I'd like to understand better is your interest in leadership. Uh, why did you pursue leadership in ham radio with these various organizations? Um, as you said in the beginning, I w I'm still studying um, within economics, basically. So I wanted to combine both worlds, but, uh, let's say the hobby and the, um, and the um, professional part of my life. And I want to become a leader in the professional life as well. So in amateur radio, it's 
it's a, a, for me it's a big thing to involve myself if I want to contribute to something, and how I can contribute and how can uh, how do I become a leader is what I've learned through amateur radio, through the time, um, through uh, basically from my first day um, when we did the, the local youth group, I was leader of this, um, getting th uh, getting things together. Uh, then getting involved into the Bavarian Contest Club, uh, getting um, contest teams together. And um, over the time, on and on and on, getting involved into IAU, getting into various organizations, as I said, WWRAW for GDXF now. It is just a passion of myself. If I, if I want to have something happening, I want to be up there and try to involve as many people as possible into our great hobby, our common hobby, amateur radio. So our hobby is somewhat known for um, a lot of older people being involved. And I think there's reasons for that. I had a great conversation with Scott Wright, uh, K0MD, the other day. Yeah. And he was talking about how, you know, we, we end up going to college and starting careers. And it's maybe difficult early on when there's a family and new career to focus a lot of energy. So um, in, in his view, and I think he's right, you know, we come out of the other side of that and, you know, older people appear to be more involved. However, that being said, I've really had the good fortune to meet a lot of mid to mid twenties to younger people that are are coming up through the ranks. I'm curious: Are you seeing a a, a generational divide? That the sorts of things that you'd like to see out of AM radio and out of the organizations that you belong to, are you seeing a divide between what you and your age group would like to see versus, say, somebody like myself? I would not a hundred percent say that there is a divide. Uh, most of the older generation do understand now that if you if we want to continue with the hobby in the future and we want to have a future, of course, that's for sure, we need to involve the youth. Um, this understanding is slowly coming up, in my personal opinion, and hopefully also the other uh, other people involved and who really want to contribute, I say. Um, therefore, I always go for the networking between the older age groups and the younger age groups. And for me, this is the the basic thing which I really do appreciate and like within our common hobby, uh, the networking. So we don't have this divide between these age groups. As you've already mentioned in, in your introduction, at TK4W, for example, we were three youngsters. I was the oldest youngster with 26 years old. The others were, uh, the, old, uh, the, the others were a little bit older. Uh, when I was in Timo Leste for Whiskey 8 X-Ray in November this year, um, there were a few older than me, but also two youngsters were aboard this thing. So people tend to understand that we don't want this div uh, dividing of age groups within our common hobby. And if we want to pursue what we do now, we need to get the youth involved. So let's move to TK4W since you brought it up. I'm, I'm really intrigued by that. I think that's where <laughs> your name first came up with me. I was talking to somebody in Europe uh, and they, they mentioned your call sign and your name and had said that you're on your way to Corsica. Tell me about the uh, the impetus for that trip. Why Corsica and why that particular contest? So why Corsica? <laughs> TK4W, to, to get a little bit of background information first. Why TK4W? The father of DJ4MX, Sven. Um, the father is DJ2MX, Mario. He was uh, back in 2011, I think, uh, with the TK4W team of BCC, Bavarian Contest Club. And we wanted to bring the tradition back up for BCC, the expeditions. What we do now uh, with TK4W was basically another cause why we went. So TK4W just had the um, history of 2011. So that's why we went for this call sign. Everything is uh, for BCC purpose and stuff. Though TK4W was our final equipment testing for the upcoming expedition to Aid Radio Guyana next year, February. With, uh, which is a full youth, the expedition. Once again, I'm the oldest, 26, And three of the four operators were a part of the team of TK4W. All our equipment was part uh, of the contest CQ Worldwide CW in Corsica. And this was basically the last high power test of everything and everything went well for us, except uh, some, some minor issues, but uh, we will solve them uh, very soon, I hope. So Corsica was First of all, at the expedition by us, by the youth, organized by the youth, and um, to say 
um, a last final uh, um, equipment test of everything we gathered throughout uh, the past months. Yeah, that's very interesting. I didn't realize it was a, a preliminary before another de-expedition. But you you did have some issues. I mean, I read the summary somewhere. Maybe it was on 38, 30 mm. scores. I mean, you had delays in transportation, high winds that damaged antennas. Um, it, it didn't <laughs> sound like a straightforward effort. T- tell us about that. Um, what went wrong and how did you make it right? Um, as you say, it, um, some things went wrong, but not like 100% wrong. We always find a way, or at least that's our stuff we want to deal, uh, how we want to deal with these. Uh, first of all, um, we planned with two days of setting up antennas. Um, in the end, it was less than one um, due to some bad weather and uh, ferries not going between Italy and Corsica. So we lost a day, first of all. Then we went to Corsica, set everything up. Everything was beautiful, working. Um, all antennas were up on the first day, on the Friday, actually. And uh, everything was working for the contest beginning. And so within the first five hours, um, there were some wind gusts. <laughs> um, to be expected, of course, um, at the um, northern shore of Corsica. Uh, that's why we made some precautions. We didn't pull out the, the mast fully and stuff like that and made extra guy wires. Though uh, this didn't hold. Um, so we uh, to, to not damage the antennas. We just took them down. Um, we had a spider beam with us, uh, uh, four element 10, three element 15, three element 20, which will also go with us to Guyana, as I mentioned before. And uh, we took the balloon out. We took the three dipoles out and put it on, on a mast. And this is how we operated high bands um, until this uh, Sunday afternoon, basically, with a triplex, of course. We had a triplex with us. Um, and then this was the, the purpose, as I said, to, to test out this equipment pieces. Um, so uh, the antennas for the high bands, 10, 15, 20, were deep dipoles for 40 meters. The vertical was withstand- withstanding, no worries at all. 80 meters, V80, perfectly in the wind. And the 160 antenna uh, on a 22 meters spider pole, no worries at all. We just took down the, the high band, the two high band antennas, the hex beam and the spider beam, to not damage the antennas, and then um, carried on with the simple dipoles. Um, which were working surprisingly well from this QTH, to be honest with you. Well, tell me about that. Uh, get, get into the operating, uh, the 48 hours. How did that go and how did you structure it? I, I'm not even sure how many team might, mates you had. So let me introduce you to the team. Uh, we were, um, as I said before, DJ2MX, DJ4MX, Mario and his son Sven. Sven will go with us to Guyana. Um, Hotel Alpha Ed Radio Tango Tommy from Hungary, who will also go with us uh, to Guyana, myself. And then we had... Um, DK2 CX Marcus and F5 SNJ William, who was our local French and Italian speaker for Corsica, which helped us a lot. Um, all great CW ops, and uh, we were uh, participating in the multi two cate- uh, category. Uh, we had uh, two radios with us, uh, sponsored by ICOM US. Um, we had equipment with us, uh, sponsored by uh, DX Engineering, for example, Spider Beam, Messi and Poloni, all the stuff. And uh, multi two meant for us we will have two running radios as i said we want to prepare for the the expedition and we don't need multiplier radios for the expedition so that's why we went for two runs only this time if we go back there's probably more we we will set up let's see but uh, multi two two runs um two amplifiers a triplexer and the vertical antennas operating was structured uh two hours each uh, per radio and then change um because we had huge pileups on the bands. We nearly did 10,000 QSOs among the six operators. So there was always plenty to do. Um, We were especially well heard um, on the low bands. Um, What what I was uh, seeing from the RBN, uh, reverse beacon network. And uh, this made it also easy to work the multipliers in between the CQ uh, calls and on the high bands, as I said before with the uh, with the simple dipoles, it's, it was not that easy to work all the multipliers on the first day, but once we put up the spider beam once again on the Saturday afternoon, uh, we had outstanding signals all over the world as well. So, Philip, you've obviously done a lot of de-expeditions, and even when you talk about this contesting effort, um, it really always comes back to de-expeditions, so clearly you enjoy that. Um, I have a lot of people that listen to this show and um, have an interest in doing a de-expedition, and something more than just one person. 
And certainly there's all different levels of de-expeditions. Uh, for example, the Swains Island W8S is pretty uh, intense. Long trip to get there, 26 hours just to get from American Samoa over to Swains. But what can you advise people that would like to do a de-expedition that's more than one person? What are the kinds of lessons you've learned and the advice you could offer to other people? Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, you have to roughly sketch what you want to achieve, how many people want you want to take, where you want to go, uh, what equipment you want to take, um, what possibilities you have to get the equipment towards the actual country location. Um, so in our case, it was clear we want to go by car. We pack two cars, go down there with the five people, one flies in. Um, and the equipment was there, we set it up, everything was good and working. Uh, for the case of Guyana, for example, uh, we will pack everything into um, into uh, plane luggage. So we will travel by, uh, by plane um, to Guyana. And uh, this requires some logistical thinking, of course, um, how to get all the equipment you want to take towards the country. And in the end, of course, you probably have to leave something at home if it doesn't fit. Um, or other option, you have to adjust. And that's uh, what we faced as well um, during the recent expeditions as well, um, that we had to exchange equipment pieces to light wider stuff. Um, take another amplifier instead of the other one, take another luggage piece, which is more light white, instead of a more bulletproof luggage piece, which is heavier and protects equipment better, probably take more bubble wrap then, instead of having something which is um, more protective. And then find a middle way how you can do, how you can transport the things, because this is the most important thing you need to do on expedition, you need some equipment. Probably you find some equipment in the country itself, so you don't need to bring it. Probably you can visit a station there and activate the station. There are so many rentals out there, probably worth to check them out. In our case in Guyana and Corsica, this was not the case. We wanted to check our equipment tested, so that's what we did. In Guyana, there are, to our knowledge, two, three, four licenses and not that many people active, so there is no chance to get active from another station and we have to bring everything our, ourselves as this, as uh, you mentioned the team in Swains needed to do as well so there is some logistical planning involved as i said in the in the beginning you need to agree with yourself what you want to do uh, get the key points out get the milestones ready and then work towards the targets of the expedition itself and what about licensing uh, that that obviously must form some of your planning right you need to make sure you can get a license but what was that process like for you with this upcoming expedition um the licensing in guiana uh, was uh, handled by our uh, other co-team lead uh, jamie m0 stv uh, as he is a uk citizen and uh, guiana as a member of the commonwealth is somehow still involved with the british um authorities so um, he took care of the license and so uh, was quite easy for him how many people are going on that particular trip is this the same crew that went to tk4w parts of it so three of the four operators uh sven dj 4 max tommy ha8 radio tango myself dk6sp and jamie m0 stv uh, the four of us will go to guyana um, so the youth on the move <laughs> as i said before uh, i'm still i'm the youngest um, going to this the expedition so it's the four of us and uh, Sven with 21 years of age will be the youngest going on this the expedition and uh, uh, yeah a lot of foundations definitely saw the point of us um, as one of the next generations going on expeditions and really helped us financing the whole thing um, I want to mention the Northern California DX Foundation here as they cover even uh, flights for Sven and did a major, major um, funding to our expedition to Guyana. And what are the dates and the call sign that we can all be looking for? Uh, the call sign will be announced shortly, um, and we will go in the February uh, next year. Not that far away then. You should get that call sign soon. <laughs> we have the call sign. It's just not announced yet. <laughs>
why are you uh, keeping it under wraps? Uh, various reasons. Um, though uh, we have agreed, we have agreed on uh, that is not to be shared yet. Um, we will though very shortly. I love the mystery that uh, this is shrouded in. First, I've heard <laughs> of this. So I, I want to get back to the fact that you're 26 years old um, and very active in ham radio. It sounds like you have other peers that are your age or younger. What do you think it is that, that is attracting young people to ham radio? I want to come back to the big community or network we have among amateur radio itself. Um, for me, the most attracting is basically when I joined 2016, the Youngsters on the Air Camp in Austria. I learned so much stuff and made friendship with so many people. For example, Tommy, Hotel Alpha at Radio Tango, I met tw- uh, back in 2016 at this particular um, camp in Austria. And we've been friends since. Um, and so many others as well. I was only traveling the world due to these friendships. Started back in 2016 at the camp. And um, I always say this to new people who want to have a new hobby and try to figure out what they want to do. And then I come up with them at the radio. I tell them about the big variety we have, the big community we have, and the network you have in the end when you network well all over the world. I mean, if you want to go to a country, there's always a local. And who knows the country best than locals? And that's what I really appreciate on my travels, um, having all the contacts all over the world, um, experiencing what they do on a daily basis and then on a local basis as well. Uh, I don't want to do the tourist stuff. I want to see how the locals do and uh, what's going on in these countries. So uh, this is what I tell the people and what impresses the most, that we know all the people all over the world, and it doesn't matter what job you have, what religion you have, how much money you have. It's just about being amateur radio operators and, yeah, enjoying what we all do, amateur radio. You know, I appreciate that answer. You know, I think I continue to look for an answer that is is more technology f- focused. You know, why would somebody be on, want to be on a HF rig when they can pick up their cell phone or get on the internet? And you've said consistently through this entire conversation that it's really about the networking um, and camaraderie. That idea of camaraderie comes up in a lot of my conversations. So um, I, I really do appreciate that you said that. Um, and, I, and I guess the translation that I'm hearing is if there's a club or an organization uh, we need to be as welcoming as possible to everybody that walks through the door, but particularly younger people, because they're probably coming there or hopefully for that sense of community and that we need to lead with that. So that's that's really great advice, and I, I appreciate that. Philip, before we wrap up, is there anything uh, on your mind that you'd like to share with the audience? Please be welcoming to you all around the world. <laughs> this is basically what I'm saying um, all over the years to everyone I meet. Um, all of the presentations I do all over the world. Please be welcoming, not only to youth, but to everyone who wants to be involved into amateur radio. Don't close your doors, open your doors, let people operate your station, guide them, not only through license courses, but also welcome them when they are new, they don't know anything about amateur radio, guide them through the process. Without everyone involved, this hobby will die very soon. And I see a positive um, evolution right now that people are opening up um, with all the great programs all over the world people open their stations um, welcome the new newbies and uh, this is basically the only thing we need to do to have a future I mean if you close the door just sit there yourself what is the thing I mean you you probably also need some new technicians for your own stations youngsters or youth in general will look for studies probably in that direction or will climb your tower in the future so also see your personal uh, things uh, within this um i mean i'm more than happy with the with the people around here to help them with their stations um they let me operate there i'm there to help whatever they want to do with this um I can test my antennas there. They are helping as well. So it's, once again, a big community, a big network of people. Everyone has a different knowledge. Everyone has a different knowledge. And this is what I very profited from um, also in my my personal life. Um, I mean, back in the days when I first set my license in 2011, there was not much knowledge. 
the knowledge I gained throughout the years now with my travels, with my operating and stuff. And now I'm at a point where I say, yeah, it still makes fun and it hopefully does for the next few years as well. Philip, that's very well said. I can't think of a better way to end this conversation. Thank you for sharing that. I've been talking to Philip Springer, Delta Kilo 6 Sugar Papa. Thank you for joining me, Philip. Thanks for having me today, Kevin. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.